Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. This week we're covering the case of Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon, two girls from the Netherlands who went travelling to Panama and then disappeared. Now I just want to put forward a quick disclaimer before I really get into this video. This has been very difficult to research because a lot of the sort of sources around this were originally in Spanish, then they've been translated to Dutch and then thirdly into English. So a lot of the sources have been very contradictory, a lot of the stuff is in Dutch or Spanish which like I can read a little bit of Spanish but not enough to read like whole articles and excerpts and things. So if I have got any of the little details wrong please feel free to correct me in the comments down below politely as always. Um, I have tried my very hardest to make sure that I have sources to back up everything I'm saying but when everything's in different languages it does get a little bit difficult so just bear that in mind. Like I said the girls were from the Netherlands and they had been saving up for their trip to Panama for months and months. It was going to be a treat for them after they graduated. They intended to go to Panama so they could learn Spanish and also volunteer with children. I'm not 100% sure how they were going to be volunteering with children, assuming maybe teaching them English or something. Um, but yeah, they intended to go and learn Spanish and volunteer. So Lisanne was 22 years old when she died. She was born September 24th, 1991. She was tall and athletic and I think she played volleyball in university. Chris was a year younger at 21 years old and she was born August 9th, 1992. She was definitely the more reserved of the two but a very creative person. The girls arrived in Panama on March 15th, 2014 but they weren't going to be starting their volunteering for a couple of weeks so they took this opportunity to just travel around the country a little bit and see all the sights. On March 29th, they finally arrived in Baquete, where they would disappear. The plan was to immediately start with their volunteer work as soon as they arrived in Baquete, but there had apparently been a mix-up between the girls and the American woman who run the school where they were going to be volunteering. The woman who ran the programme said that there was no place for them and therefore they had to come back next week, and obviously the girls were annoyed about this. Now Chris kept a diary, and in her diary she actually wrote about it and said that she was disappointed, and said that she just wanted to get stuck in with the volunteer work. She wrote in her diary, there was not yet a place for us so we could start. The school thought it odd as it was all planned since months ago. Tomorrow they will try to get hold of the head teacher. This was a real disappointment. Anyway, go with the Panamanian flow. This meant that they now had a week to fill in Baquete. Now Baquete is a small mountain town in western Panama very, very close to the Continental Divide. Apparently it's quite the hot spot for outdoor adventurers with hikes through the mountain, rock climbing, and water sports, river rafting, and the like. On the 1st of April, the girls decide to fill their time with a hike into the jungle. They chose to take La Pianista Trail, which is roughly translated into English as the Piano Player Trail. It was named so because of the way it sort of steps up the mountain, similar to keys on a piano. It leads up 6,600 feet to the Continental Divide, where you just have a beautiful, beautiful view of the mountains. That morning, the girls actually wrote on Facebook that they had had brunch with two other Dutch men that they'd met in the area. They also wrote that they intended to explore and have a walk around Baquete. So they waved goodbye to their host family at about 11am. We're not 100% sure on the exact time, but it would have been around that time. So the girls in Baquete were staying with this host family. They just had the room to themselves and the host family were kind of like looking after them, keeping an eye on them. They didn't want to stay in a hotel, obviously, as it would have been very expensive for two travellers. So the Pianista Trail is actually a little bit outside of Baquete. So it's assumed that they probably caught a taxi to the entrance of the trail. And the trail itself, I don't think is a very difficult one according to what I've read on the internet. It can get a little bit treacherous in places if the weather's bad, but all things considered, it should be a pretty easy trail straight up the mountain and back down again, but I think back down was just a little bit more tricky than on the way up. From what I read online, the main issue with the trail is that it isn't that well maintained, so it can get a little bit bushy at points, but it starts off with sort of allegedly two kilometer stroll through fields before slowly starting the incline. So the host family become a little bit concerned that night when the girls don't return home. Now from what I could figure, the girls actually had a dog, the host family's dog called Blue, join them on their trek up the mountain. However, Blue had returned sort of earlier that afternoon and the girls hadn't. The family do a quick search around their home, have a look outside, and they notice the girls aren't there. 
but what really can they do about it at this point? They're two sort of young adult girls traveling. It's like not crazy to think they would have gone out to a bar or something. So they didn't really think much of it at the time. However, the next day, April 2nd, about 8 a.m., they had an appointment with a local tour guide called Feliciano Gonzalez. And the girls just don't turn up for this. And Feliciano's a little bit confused as to why they haven't turned up. They, he doesn't know if they've sort of maybe slept in and forgotten about it or if they've just decided not to tell him. So he goes by the host family's house to see where they are. It's at this point that they realise that this is probably something a little bit more serious than the girls just going out and having some fun. So they contact the authorities. Now the authorities don't actually do anything right away because again like I said they can do what they like, they're young adult girls travelling. I think it was by that evening on April 2nd they still hadn't returned that the authorities actually started to take it a little bit more seriously. Witnesses said that they saw Chris and Lisanne leave for the trailhead about 10am that morning, which kind of matches up with the 11am that the host family said. We know it's around that time in the morning. They said the girls were just wearing light clothing with a small backpack between them. The first group of people who actually went out to search were volunteers, it wasn't the police or investigators at this point. A group of local farmers who knew the area very very well set out on foot to look for the girls. However the authorities did begin to do aerial searches sort of looking overground for the girls. On April 6th, five days later at this point, the girls families arrive in Panama themselves with Dutch investigators and cadaver dogs. Now the Dutch authorities were joining the Panamanian authorities, is Panamanian right? I feel like that would be right. Um, and they searched the trail together and still nobody can find any trace of the girls. Authorities begin to interview people in the local area, see if they've seen anything or saw the girls at all that day. And a lot of people actually came forward. Five people came forward saying they saw the girls in the town on the day they went missing. However, we found out later this could not be possible for reasons I'll talk about in a little bit. The most likely explanation for all these five sightings of the girls in the town that day is that it actually happened the day before. On April 8th, huge, huge search parties go out into the jungle to look for the girls. So many people, they had the cadaver dogs, which never really picked up any scent at all, and they were sending up flares as well but still, they never found the girls. And that's it for the initial investigation, really. They searched for the girls, they couldn't find them, they couldn't find any trace whatsoever. Until 10 weeks later, on June 14th, across the Continental Divide, a blue backpack was found, the same as the backpack the girls had with them when they went missing. And we're not talking nearby either, we're talking about 170-ish kilometers away, about a 12 hour walk. An indigenous couple find the blue backpack sort of raised above the banks of the river and they immediately sort of handed it into the police because I think this was a very, very big case in Panama. So kind of everyone in the area knew about the girls and knew the kind of things they were looking for. So I don't know if the couple just found the backpack and handed it into police just thinking it could be something or if they actually knew about the girls. Now this couple actually grew crops in the fields on the side of the riverbed. So they were there quite a lot and they were insistent that the bag wasn't there the day before. A lot of people speculate in this case that this couple found the bag so much sooner than they said they did. But honestly, I kind of wonder what's the point in them finding this bag and keeping hold of it for so long. They didn't take anything out of it. It was kind of in perfect condition when it was handed into the police. So I'm not sure why people would speculate that they had the bag for longer than that. I think they just found it and immediately did the right thing. I'm going to have to read off my notes for this bit, but inside the bag, they found $83 in American cash, Lisanne's passport, two pairs of cheap sunglasses, completely unbroken, two mobile phones. They found Chris's iPhone 4 and Lisanne's Samsung S3. They found Lisanne's camera. It was a point and shoot Canon camera and two bras and a water bottle. Everything in this bag was in great condition, completely undamaged, despite the 72 days out in the heat and the elements and a very likely trip down the river. This was the break in the case that the authorities really needed. Investigators immediately start looking through the technology that was found in the bag, the two mobile phones and the camera, and what they find makes for a very disturbing case. Now let's start by talking about the phones. Now like I said, Chris had an iPhone 4 and Nissan had a Samsung S3 and the police immediately start to look into the call records on these phones. It was very obvious very quickly that the girls had been desperately trying to get in contact with people. They were in trouble and they needed help and they couldn't get through to anyone. 
In this region of Panama, the deep jungle, of course, there wasn't any phone reception at all. The last activity on the phone showed to be on April 11th, 10 days after they disappeared. However, the first concerning activity on the phone came just a few hours after the start of the hike. At 4.39 p.m., the iPhone attempts to make a call to the Dutch emergency number, 112. However, this doesn't go through, there's no signal, and of course, 112 wasn't the Panamanian emergency number. This is the one thing I say when you go traveling abroad to another country. Find out the emergency number first thing. It is so, so important. Obviously, this call doesn't go through. So a few minutes later at 4.51 p.m., the Samsung S3 attempts the same call to 112. And again, there's no signal, so it doesn't go through. On April 2nd, there's more emergency call attempts from both phones, mostly to 112, but this day, they do also try to call 911 as well. On the 3rd, there's a 911 call at 9.33 a.m. and the call connects just for a couple of seconds before breaking up. They never even got to speak to anyone. On the 5th, it seems like the Samsung S3 battery completely dies and it's not used again. The iPhone isn't used to make any emergency calls, but it is turned on multiple times to check for signal. Now this happens a lot. Both of the phones are turned on intermittently to just check for phone signal and then they're turned off again. So clearly they're trying to preserve their battery and they're just sort of turning on at the same time every day to check for signal and they never have any luck. On the 6th is where things start to get even darker here. There's multiple incorrect PIN password attempts on the iPhone. Somebody's trying to get into the phone and it just isn't working. And this iPhone never received the correct code again. So my small theory here is that by this point, something had happened to Chris. Either she was dead or incapacitated at this point. And so Lasanne was trying to get into the iPhone. Now she didn't own an iPhone herself. So maybe she didn't know that you can just sort of swipe right and click the emergency call button. So she's just trying to get into the phone and it's not working. Although clearly she did figure it out eventually because more 911 calls start to go through, of course, no signal. Between the 7th and the 10th of April, 77 emergency calls are made and not a single one connects. On the 11th, the iPhones turn on at 10.51 a.m. and it's turned off again at 11.56 and then it's never touched again. So that's the phones. However, the camera tells its own story as well. Obviously, the girls were taking their own photos throughout the trip and on this hike, it was no different. So the camera showed that the girls reached the top of the trail at about 1 p.m. from the angle of the sun in the sky. And there were photos of both the girls at the peak looking very happy and very excited with themselves. And then there are more photos and the photos gradually get a little bit creepier and creepier as time goes on. This is irrefutable. The girls reached the peak of La Pianista about 1 p.m. that day. So all of the witnesses saying they saw them in town that day Absolutely no way. The girls were at the peak. There is photographic evidence of this. About 2 p.m. another photo is taken of Chris in a gully. She just looks like she's happy and exploring. So obviously at this point the girls should have been descending back down the trail. And I don't know if this gully was back on the trail on the way down or if by this point they'd started to venture off. Whether something scared them so they felt the need to go off into the jungle or they just thought they'd be adventurous and go for a look around and they got lost. All of the tour guides in the area will tell you that this trail is fine as long as you stay on it. If you go off of it, all the jungle looks the same and you will get lost. I think it is likely that the girls just went off to do some exploring and then couldn't find their way back. I mean, they were at the peak of sort of the trail. I'm not sure if it was the peak of a mountain, but it was obviously a very high point. So if they'd maybe continued walking down that way and ended up down the other side of this mountain, it may have been that they just couldn't get back up. And maybe that is why they ended up calling the emergency number just two hours later. It could have been they just realized that there was no way of getting back up there and getting to the trail. Maybe it's likely as well that something had happened to one of them in the two hours. Maybe one of them got injured or hurt their ankle or something and just couldn't get back down. Um, but this is a very popular trail. About 90 tourists a day go up La Pianista. So if they got injured on the trail, it's very likely that they would have been found. Um, so I think they just wandered off and something happened, whether they couldn't get back up or they were injured. After this, the camera goes dormant for seven days and it's not picked up again until April 8th, late at night. About 1am, 90 photos were taken and of these photos, about 87 of them were just dark. They weren't completely black, but they were dark, so much so that you couldn't 
figure out what the photos are of. Now these photos have never actually been released to the public um, but from what I could gather on the internet they're sort of taken in a kind of code way so it's like a photo is taken close up to something and then a little bit further away and then a photo is taken pointing upwards and then that sort of pattern just keeps repeating now apparently they've never been able to figure out if this code was intentional or if they were just like randomly taking photos but there is some kind of like method to the madness here it seems so there were three photos taken this night that weren't completely black and you can kind of figure out what it is apparently there's one photo which i couldn't find anywhere on the internet so i don't know if it's actually been released i'm going to carry on looking after this video so if i do find it i'll insert it but it seems to be a close-up of chris's hair apparently with blood matted in it um there was another photo of the top of a rock and on top of this rock are two sort of sticks they don't look like particularly sturdy sticks but they're just sort of like pulled off a tree with pieces of plastic bag tied around them now were the girls using these pieces of plastic bag to maybe signal for help maybe they were waving them these sticks definitely weren't like hiking sticks because they were quite thin they looked like they'd snap under a lot of weight um, but this is very weird and as well on the rock it looks like there may have been like two chewing gum wrappers or something. We don't know if the girls had chewing gum in their bag when they left. But yeah it's just little pieces of tin foil so it looks like on the rock as well. The third photo is a little bit more difficult to decipher. It kind of looks like it was taken standing on the edge of a rock looking down over like a cliff or something. There's sort of lots of leaves and like bushes and stuff. Some people say it looks like it's a river. Um, some people say it's not. What we do know that night is apparently there was heavy, heavy rain on April 8th. So the fact that the leaves do look kind of like wet doesn't necessarily mean it's a river. It could just mean it was raining. Um, some people even say that it was Lisanne taking it to show Chris's body or something at the bottom of the cliff. I don't see that. Some people like say they can make out of a outline I can't see it at all but there's a lot of theories around these photos but they're very cryptic. Apparently the evidence also points towards one photo being deleted off the memory card. Apparently each photo is sort of like given a number like 507, 508, 509. Apparently in all of these photos there was just one that was deleted. Now I couldn't figure out if it was one that was deleted on this night of April 8th or if it was an earlier photo. If it was an earlier photo it's likely that Maybe Lasanne took a photo of Chris and Chris was like, I look disgusting, delete it. And so they deleted it. But if it was actually a photo deleted later on, on this night of April 8th, then that's a little bit strange because why would they bother? So there are a few theories as to why so many photos were taken on this night. A lot of people say that they were trying to light their way with the camera flash. Um, but this makes no sense because we all know if you're in a dark room and there's a sudden flash, your eyes go funny, you can't see, you start to see spots. And it leads to like a temporary blindness, so they call it. I think it's retina blindness. I can't remember. Um, but this doesn't really make much sense. If they were doing it, they probably would have given up after just a few flashes. Because I don't think they could have carried on for as long as they did. The second theory is that they could have been trying to scare away an animal. Which I think is as likely as anything else. Um, this jungle would have been filled with all kinds of predators. Spiders, snakes, even like big cats. I think there are like jaguars in this jungle. So they could have been scaring away an animal. However, the third theory, and the one that I personally think is most likely, is that this was the night that the search parties were out. April 8th, so many people, they were sending up flares, big bright flares into the sky. And it is very, very likely that the girls would have seen these and they maybe they realised that people were looking for them or maybe they realised that people were just out in the jungle. And so they were using the flash to try and get the attention of the rescuers, which clearly didn't really work. I'm not sure how dense this jungle was, but I'm going to go ahead and assume that it was very dense jungle, lots of trees, lots of foliage. And so therefore, if they were sort of sat on the ground using this light, then... I doubt anybody, any rescuers would have seen this tiny camera flash. It would have made more sense if they'd sort of scaled up a tree or something. But we don't know how healthy the girls were at this point. I mean, this was 
about a week on after they've gone missing i can only assume they've barely been drinking and barely been eating i mean to be honest it's amazing that they even lasted as many days as they did there's evidence of them being alive or at least one of them being alive up until the 11th of april that's 10 days after they went missing and i think you can go up to nine days maximum without water i think it's three weeks without food i can only assume they're drinking water from the rivers and stuff which wouldn't have been clean water they probably would have got quite ill from it um, I don't have a clue what they would have been eating. We know that they had a water bottle in their backpack with them, so maybe they rationed that water for as long as they could. Um, but I would love to know how they managed to survive for as long as they did. One thing that I find a little bit strange, and I've seen other people on the internet mention the same thing, is that at no point did they record any kind of goodbye message or and I love you note to their families. Maybe they weren't the type of girls to think about stuff like that. And I know if I was in that position, that would be like, a priority for me like in the notes app on the phone just put a little note there or like record something on the camera but maybe they were just so focused on survival that it didn't even cross their mind so you can't really judge them for it but it is something i find a little little bit odd or even just write in the notes what was happening to them chris did love to keep a diary so it is a little bit strange that she didn't write any notes or anything so let's go back to the backpack. The discovery of the backpack led to brand new searches all around the area in which it was found. It was found near a little village called Alto Romero. This search led to Chris's shorts being found neatly folded and zipped up on a rock by the river. This was a few kilometres away from the backpack and this is just another element of strange and creepy to add to this already traumatizing story seems they followed the course of the river that's what a lot of authorities and investigators think in this case when they left the trail la pianista it's likely that they found a river and they just started to follow it assuming that at some point it would lead to civilization only they followed it the wrong way they ended up walking in the opposite direction to Paquete. i thought there was a reason that they couldn't get back up and start following it the other way once they realized they were going the wrong direction or it's also a kind of psychological phenomenon i read that when humans are lost they just get so stubborn and they just decide to stick with what they're doing because they've already made it this far and so they'll just carry on two months later close to where the backpack was found they actually begin to find human bones they find a pelvis and a boot and in this boot were the bones of Lisanne's foot now this sounds very strange very gory but this isn't actually as odd as it may sound it's actually quite common for when bodies sort of end up decomposing or if a body falls into a river it's quite often that boots with sort of bones still in are the first thing to be found because the boot protects the flesh inside but the pelvis bone that was found was completely clear of flesh it was just clean the boot however the bones inside were still attached to flesh flesh showed very quickly that the boot and foot belonged to lisanne whereas the pelvis bone belonged to chris i think in total they found 33 bones or bone fragments 28 of these belonged to lisanne only a handful of them belonged to chris i think they found her pelvic bone along with a left rib and just small fragments after that. This was the first confirmation they had that the girls were actually dead. They were no longer looking for missing people, they were looking for bones. And although, to be honest, at this point it was the end of August, and so it would have been fairly obvious already, I can't imagine how heartbreaking it would have been for the family to just lose that last little bit of hope that the girls were still alive. Now, all of Lisanne's bones were in pretty standard condition, as you would expect for bones that have been lying out in the jungle for a few months, most likely. However, Chris's bones were a little bit odd in that it seems like they had been bleached. There were no discernible scratches or marks on any of the bones and there was no evidence of shooting or stabbing either. Now, would a body fully decompose in the jungle in that time? When I first read about it, I was very inclined to think that it's totally normal in that heat, a body would definitely decompose down to bone in that time and with all the animals and predators as well, of course they would eat all the meat off the bones. As morbid as that sounds, that is what I assumed. However, from what I've read, all of the experts in this case actually think that it's likely that their bodies wouldn't have decomposed that much. Apparently there are other bodies found in the area over the years, even washed up in the river, that haven't decomposed to the level that Chris and Lisanne had. The bone bleaching in this case is still the number one thing that really throws people off. Because if it wasn't for that, you would kind of just think it was a cut and dry 
girls go missing in the forest and end up dying situation. But the bone bleaching is unnatural and unusual. A lot of people believe that there was a third party involved in the girls' deaths. Now apparently there was actually no effort in the investigation made to determine if the bone bleaching was natural or man-made. And apparently a lot of people say that bone bleaching is something that's done a lot by Mexican cartels. So a lot of people say that's exactly what they do to bodies after people have been killed. And therefore a lot of people suspect that maybe the Mexican cartel were involved in this. But why? You would expect bones found in the middle of the jungle, even if they have been bleached, to have been sort of ravaged by animals, but again, they were kind of spotless. Apparently quicklime was used a lot in the area to help restore balance to the rapidly depleting rainforest soil, but also no soil samples were taken where the bones were found. Now are the Panamanian authorities trying to cover something up here, or were they just bad at their jobs? If quicklime was found in this soil, then that could explain a lot. But if it isn't found in the soil, then maybe they need to start looking into quicklime suppliers in the area or people who have recently bought it. But they just wrote this case off as a hiking accident right away. Now the prosecutor cited that the girls died by being dragged into the river. That was Panama's official stance on the death, that they were dragged by some kind of predator, I can assume, into the river. But this makes no sense because there were no abrasions on the bones. Or their secondary theory was that the girls were killed by wild animals. Like I said, there were snakes, spiders, big cats, plenty of dangerous animals around. I think I read that one of the world's most deadly snakes is found very commonly in the Panama jungle around this area. So it's I don't think it's completely off the charts to say that they could have been killed by a wild animal. I think it's very, very possible, but this doesn't really explain the bone bleaching. And if they just had taken soil samples from the area and seen that there was phosphorus or quicklime in the soil, could have explained a lot, but they didn't. Apparently there have been other reports of murder in the area around the time that the girls disappeared and this leads a lot of people to think that there was a possible serial killer on the loose. However, let's say if this was the case and the girls were attacked at the top of the trail and dragged into the jungle, how did they still have their phones on them and how did they manage to keep calling for authorities constantly? I mean, even though there is no service in the jungle, if they're being hunted down by a serial killer, you would think they'd maybe take the phones off them, just in case. But their phones are on them the entire time, their camera's on them the entire time. I think it does look like at this point they did just wander off into the jungle and get lost. But that isn't to say that that's how they died. If it was a serial killer, you would think that they would just bury their body whole and not go to the effort of bleaching bones. Like I said, only Chris's bones were bleached. Lisanne's were totally, totally fine. I do wonder maybe if there was something in Chris's sort of like genetics that made her bones susceptible to bleaching, maybe from the sun or from whatever was in the soil. Maybe her bones were particularly susceptible to it. I don't know, I'm not a scientist and just sort of throwing ideas out there. If any of you are scientists and would know anything about that, please leave me a comment down below. They're like my favourite comments to receive when I'm not sure on something like technical and you guys always come through, it's always great. Apparently there are also 30 unidentified fingerprints on the contents of the blue backpack, but the authorities never cross-checked these fingerprints against the people who were actually handling the items in the backpack. So they don't know whose fingerprints are whose, who was unauthorised to be touching this stuff. And it's very, very likely that if the girls were stalked and hurt by someone that their fingerprints would be on this stuff, but nope. Now we just have some questions to ponder over, things that we don't really have answers to, but could be interesting to talk about in the comments. So the number one question obviously is how did the girls end up off the trail? Did they want to explore? Were they forced off the trail? Is there a reason they ended up going off? I personally more inclined to believe that they just wanted to explore further. Um, but again, you don't know. At what point did they realise they were in trouble? And why didn't they just turn around? I mean, I've spoke about this a lot in this video, but that is one of the main things that really baffles me. Why didn't they just turn around and start walking the opposite way again? How were the items in the backpack in such great condition? I mean, nothing in there was damaged whatsoever. A lot of people assume that the backpack went for a journey down the river before getting washed up on the riverbed. But unless the backpack was like top of the range waterproof, 
I find it hard to believe that all of the items inside were completely undamaged. I mean, to me, it doesn't seem like the backpack took a journey down the river at all. It just seems like somebody placed it on the riverbed. Why were the shorts placed where they were? There's a lot of different speculation on the internet about this. A lot of people say that Chris's shorts were folded and placed on the rock because this is the place where Chris died and Lisanne carried on on her journey. Or maybe Lisanne wanted to be able to come back and mourn her friend at that spot. Or maybe at this point she'd lost Chris a long time beforehand and wanted to have like markers of where to go my only question is why would you have chris's shorts i mean maybe the girls like stripped because it was very hot or maybe their things got wet i could assume the shorts were maybe denim but then again they had the bras in the bag so if they wanted to be marking their way surely they just use the bras which was actually my next question i've just written down bras why did they take the bras off a lot of people ponder this online to be honest if i was stuck in the jungle for 10 days i would probably have taken my bra off a long time before as well how did they survive so long is a big, big question for me because it's very likely they would have got ill from drinking the river water very quickly. I think it's very clear that something happened to them very quickly after they went off the trail. I mean, it was two hours later that they did the first emergency call. So how did they survive for so long after this original thing that happened? Were they just calling because they were lost or had one of them got injured? I mean, this was the jungle, but it did get very, very cold at night and it's likely that they may have got hypothermia from being out in it. Like I said earlier, a lot of people speculate that they were hurt by a serial killer or somebody intentionally killed them. But again, my question is, why would they leave valuables in a backpack? Unless it was somebody who did it just for the thrill of killing, which seems very lucky that they would come across two possibly naive girls wandering through the jungle on their own. Surely most criminals would take the money. I mean, $83, like that's a decent amount of money, isn't it? And let alone the money, there were two very modern phones of the time in the bag and a camera. Why didn't they leave any markers or messages on the way? You'd surely think they would like mark things into trees in case people were looking for them. Like that seems like the logical thing to do, but they never did any of that. If they got into trouble so early on, emergency call just two hours after they reached the peak, how did they travel 12 hours away? That's a long way, it's a lot of walking. And why did nobody see the girls on the trail? Like I said earlier, up to 90 tourists a day are up and down there, along with tour guides and also indigenous people who live in the area. Why did nobody see them and why? It just seems a little bit strange. So theories here I've kind of already touched on quite a lot, but we'll just we'll round them up at the end here. The first theory I'm going to talk about is the possibility of foul play, a third party being involved. Maybe the third party was with them the entire time from when they set off at the bottom of the trail up, and maybe the third party was with them as they ventured off into the jungle. However, there were no photos of a third party, unless that one photo that was deleted possibly was. I don't know, there's nothing in the photos of the two girls that would suggest there was another person with them either. I know a lot of people will be thinking at this point about the two Dutchmen that they'd had dinner with or brunch with earlier in the day. Um, they were cleared completely by the Dutch authorities. By the time the investigation really started, these two men were back in the Netherlands and they had nothing to do with it. They just ran into two other Dutch girls in Panama and decided to go for brunch. If there was a third party with them who brought them to harm 10 days later, this third person would have been just as weak and ill as they were. So how would they go to the effort of killing them, possibly bleaching Chris's bones, scattering their bones everywhere? It just doesn't make any sense. I mean, clearly if they were murdered, the bones were bleached and destroyed to hide any evidence. It, but it just seems like an extra step that isn't really needed. Just hide the bodies in the jungle or bury it. I'm, I'm sure there's lots of other ways to hide a body in the jungle rather than bleaching the bones and scattering them everywhere. And also, like I mentioned, what killer would allow them to have their phones on them and continually call for emergency services? A lot of people say that the tour guide, Feliciano Gonzalez, who was meant to meet them on the second, is very suspicious. Apparently, he had a lot of photos with younger tourists on his Facebook and stuff like that. I suppose he's as good a suspect as any, but also at the end of the day, whilst the girls were in the jungle most likely, he was searching for them in Bequete. So unless he kidnapped them and then hid them somewhere and then managed to transport them 12 hours and then kill them, it doesn't make any sense. I feel like I've said it doesn't make any sense a hundred times in this video, but it just, it just doesn't. It doesn't. None of this 
matches up to anything else. The next theory I'm going to talk about is an accident and I think personally in this case that Occam's razor is very relevant here. Occam's razor is the simplest solution, tends to be the correct one and the simplest solution in this case is that the girls just wandered off the trail, got completely lost and just started to walk through the jungle and eventually ended up perishing and animals got their bones and sort of destroyed their bodies. Lisanne's foot, still intact in the boot, did show signs of possible fracture or maybe it had been broken. So it is very possible that maybe they wandered off this trail and Lisanne hurt her foot so they started to call for the emergency services and couldn't and because Lisanne had hurt her foot they couldn't sort of scramble back up the mountain so they just started to walk in the opposite direction. I mean can you really walk for 12 hours on a broken foot? I suppose it depends how badly you want to survive in that situation. I guess for a bit adrenaline would kick in and then after that you just want to survive don't you? I think they most likely followed the stream or the river and just kept following it so they kind of had some sense of direction here. First of all they got ill and dehydrated and Chris started to go downhill fast and Chris it seems would have been the first one to die here. Like I mentioned earlier, maybe she died where Lisanne placed her shorts and folded them up as a sort of site to grieve or just so she had some kind of marker there. Lisanne couldn't get into Chris's phone after I think it was the 5th or the 6th of April so it's likely that she actually died pretty early on and Lisanne was left on her own. A lot of people also speculate that maybe Chris fell into the river at this point and she couldn't be saved so again Lisanne put the marker there. Maybe at this point Lisanne kind of just gives up, she doesn't want to stray too far from where her friend died and so she kind of stays in the area which is why Lisanne and Chris's bones are actually found very close to each other and why the backpack was actually found quite near as well. I mean the most tragic thing for me at this point is the girls were actually not that far from civilization. they weren't that far from this indigenous couple who found the backpack if they just managed to go on for a little bit longer they may have been saved. If they had just died it's very likely the animals would have found the bodies and stripped the meat off the bones and the bones were just scattered around just by nature, just by animals being there, although this doesn't explain the bleaching on Chris's bones. Or the final theory is a little bit of both. Maybe they did get lost in the jungle and they were just wandering around trying to find their way out and eventually they come across someone who they assume can save them and help them, probably an indigenous person in the area, maybe a tour guide, someone who obviously spent a lot of time in the jungle and maybe knew what they were doing. And the girls place their hope in this person and this person ends up harming them. And at this point it wouldn't have been hard to hurt the girls, they were very frail and in a very bad situation. Both the girls' families are convinced that foul play was involved and that the Panamanian authorities just haven't done their job properly. But the Panamanian authorities are very insistent that it was a natural death and that the girls just got into a hiking, trekking, jungle accident. I did read something about the girls' families trying to sue the Panamanian government um, but I couldn't read any follow-up on that so I'm not sure what happened there but I don't know what happened to these girls all I know is that it's so tragic and I cannot imagine being in that situation lost in the jungle not knowing what's going on whether you're with somebody or you're not with somebody it is a terrifying terrifying situation to be in and I wouldn't wish it on anybody I'd be really intrigued to know what you guys think in this case, so make sure you're putting all of your comments down below. If you enjoyed this, please make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you know anybody else who loves true crime or would also be interested in this video, please make sure you share it with them and get my channel out there a little bit. And yeah, I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.